And these are all my photos, so. And these ones are all stolen off of me, so um, that's okay to have them on the internet, kind of, because I took all these photos at least. So most of these are from Adelaide, which is you know where I basically I've been in Sydney for three years now. But I'll let that scroll on for a little while, and uh, I'll later on go into um, some of the things I've been doing on walls since I've been in Sydney, which have pretty much everything I've done in Sydney has been by invitation and request, which is very very nice. And um, at least uh, in Ad in Sydney, I've been able to earn a living being involved in street art primarily, which I couldn't do in Adelaide. And uh, Adelaide, I was doing lots and lots of very completely different kinds of activities for a long, long time. So um, to make bills meet and different sort of seasonal work and things like that. And I guess Sydney's been much less trouble earning a reasonable income as an artist. Um, so yeah, anyway, I'm Chris Tam. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. And um, I just am talking a bit about sort of my involvement in um, street art and graffiti and urban art or whatever people want to call it this week. Um, I guess uh, my own involvement in street art started in um, the late 80s. Uh, my older brother actually used to paint over cigarette advertising when I was young. And I kind of had a bit of influence on me. And I guess I had a lot of friends who were a bit older than me and the uni and things like that. So I got involved in sort of hippie punk politics and things early on. Got into producing kind of anonymous poster art for quite a few years, which... It was kind of political, but it didn't have any specific message or any specific target or cause or goal. It was never, it was always anonymous. Um, we didn't think it was kind of art. Maybe it was kind of like political mischievousness or something like that, but we never actually kind of thought of it as um, art making or called ourselves artists. Um, and I probably did that for five or six years and had a bit of a break while I was still down with um, lots of pets and uh, domestic life and working and uh, kind of got back into it again um, a little bit later in the late, it's sort of around 97 onwards I started noticing more and more work that was kind of sticker, uh, people making more stickers and paste ups which kind of Adelaide had a really really lively scene of this kind of um, poster and um, um, stuff going on. So there are lots of like, four artists which I first started noticing in town, there wasn't actually a lot of stuff up at the time and uh, one of them was uh, Sink, who went on to be influential in the whole movement um, scene in Melbourne of um, street art. And he was in Ha Ha, James Dodd, who also came from Adelaide. And uh, quite a few people from Adelaide ended up all running off to Melbourne every year and were very involved in the first few years of that scene exploding in Melbourne. Um, there was also another artist called uh, Cloak and Dagger, who did a lot of these grey letterbox stickers or portraits of 20th century people as stickers, and he went on to stencils later on. And um, Cadet, who was another artist who made a lot of uh, stickers, uh, first of all, they were printed, and then they became um, increasingly stencil and printer-based. So um, we all kind of start off doing stickers and posters and using different techniques and materials all the time, whatever we could find or scrounge, uh, whatever was cheap, <laughs> we would try to make art out of. And quite often when we were um, combing around the alleyways and things, um, you would find lots of art materials thrown out all the time, amazing stuff, um, advertising agencies. I once found several thousand dollars worth of Pantone markers in an advertising agency's dumpster. Um, just incredible stuff that this whole row of advertising agencies would throw out. So we would kind of use anything we could find and get hold of. But um, stencils was something that we got into more and more as a way of producing stickers and paste up. So probably around 2001, stencils were becoming cool. And 2002, they were kind of um, up and running. And so by 2002, um, me and some friends of mine started to organise some festivals. I started doing graffiti tourism in Adelaide. So taking people on tours, which I still do in Newtown now. And, I sort of do a couple of tours a month, taking groups from children to pensioners groups to people who are for it, to people who are against it, around to have a look at it. And um, so yeah, I've been doing that since about 2002. And I guess 2003, we put on like our first kind of street art festival, trying to actually get as many venues as we could possibly book and just fill them full of street art. And, um, and there's still versions of that festival still happening in Sydney, in Adelaide now as part of the, um, Fringe Festival in Adelaide, there's a format and uh, ST5K Street Dreams, which has been like all sort of evolved out of things I started years ago. And even like um, some of the first zine fairs and things like that we had in Adelaide, um, which I was kind of involved in running and things too. So um, lots and lots of kind of um, 
really, really, as you can see, there's lots of really interesting way you've made stickers and paste ups, collage as well. There was a big scene of people just making collages and sticking them everywhere. It was very, very sort of data situationist inspired. So we had a really, really good, lively scene. And I guess um, increasingly that scene has kind of diminished. So I guess 10 years ago, there was a lot more empty real estate and alleyways and laneways in Adelaide. And now it's kind of, um, yeah, lots and lots of space. Like this space here now has a, um, iron bars and spikes in front of it, for example. Whole laneways have been locked off. Um, so many new developments, you know, that everywhere is kind of well lit, well monitored, people living there. They've increased the whole population of the city by thousands as well. So it kind of changed that whole kind of landscape. But I guess maybe pub culture and other kinds of culture probably did suffer. Bands and things probably also suffered and places you could play music at kind of suffered. So I could kind of see a lot of the culture and things I was interested in kind of diminishing. And I kind of go back now and it, it just seems very, very different to when I left. And so. Anyway, um, I originally came to Sydney when I was kind of having lots of problems with arthritis and I was just kind of determined to have a go of it here, no matter what. And kind of very, very quickly, I ended up working at Mays Lane for about six months as a curator and just very quickly from going to basically gallery shows, caught up with a whole lot of artists in Sydney, um, particularly the movement crew, who are basically a bunch of guys that draw cartoon characters. And it started off as just pasters, posters and stickers and things like that, but most of the artists involved in that are now all doing freehand aerosol art and um, exhibiting in art galleries now. I and mean, there's quite a lot of them who, that's all they're doing now, is they're purely exhibiting in galleries and doing murals. And um, There's probably a lot of people who have become successful enough that they don't have to run around anymore. And it's kind of, I guess, for some people in some ways, doing things on the street has become a way of getting yourself a gallery career, getting yourself an illustrator career, getting yourself a graphic design career now. And some people are kind of jump on board the culture for six months, hijack whatever it is that they want and uh, use it to sort of launch their careers. So that's kind of um, increasingly happens a lot. And I guess with any kind of interesting alternative culture, you get that kind of happening. So I guess um, I kind of um, think there's some people out there who have been doing this for 10, 20 years. There's plenty of people. There's actually, I know a lot of artists who are eight years older than me. I turned 40 a month ago. There's eight years older than me artists in Sydney who have been doing it ever since the early 80s. And I actually know a lot of guys who've gotten back into it because their kids have left home now. So they feel that uh, without the parental responsibilities to worry about, they're getting back into it. And um, I would really say there's any weekend in New South Wales, there are probably several thousand people painting aerosol murals with permission. So there's thousands of people doing it. And um, I guess that's with permission. Of course, obviously, there's many more <laughs> times people doing this without permission. But also just think of there's places which no one ever sees, like drains covered in graffiti. Um, there's a lot of um, quite um, abandoned buildings, factories completely covered where the public don't ever see it. But every week, the whole place gets a face job and is completely transformed. Um, Glebe tram barns, which uh, I think they were supposed to spend $80 million on a project to get these trams back on the road that had been lovingly restored. And the place is just a completely now a mess of totally uncared for, not locked up. Everything's been vandalized and graffiti, but they've actually gone on making car ads in this place. The Dunlop factory, which used to make sport equipment in the 70s and 80s, that's all covered in graffiti, but they're actually making another car ad was made in there. There's a lot of pictures of it, and a lot of photographers can just walk in, just walk in, and I mean, I've been in these places, and there's more photographers in there <laughs> than there are graffiti artists. There's so many people in there taking photos and modelling shoots, um, advertisements, all using these kinds of venues and places. So, um, in a lot of ways, I think this kind of art and style and things and the spirit of it has come to be increasingly mainstream, that it's kind of come to be a symbol of kind of urban freedom because why car ads love the idea, you know, that car ads and graffiti don't think there's really a lot to do with each other, but um, it's kind of come to be used as some kind of symbol of, of youthful freedom or something like that. And I guess there's all sorts of strange products aimed at youth and kids using graffiti imagery, uh, including the Yogo chocolate dessert mix for kiddies, has the snake holding a spray can, riding on a wall. Um, and there was also a candy product that was a candy aerosol that sprayed aerosol candy in your mouth for children. It's got a little homeboy with his baseball cap on and a skateboard, which is kind of encouraging people to inhale poisonous spray paint, which is an incredibly toxic, nasty substance. So um, 
a really, really badly thought out kids candy product anyway. So on one hand, you've got people trying to ban everything that even looks anything like this. And it's not a keep Australia beautiful, I've kind of come to declare war on anything looking like this. And um, it's now illegal for minors to even have a can of aerosol paint on them. You can go, go to jail as an adult if some kindly art teacher doesn't say that you had a reason to do it, to have it on you, or someone had some legitimate reason. But um, yeah, basically minors can be kind of seized and apparently locked up as an adult. It, it hasn't happened to my knowledge. <laughs> I kind of suspect that they would probably appeal and go to some higher level of court and it would be kicked out. But um, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing how sort of fanatically poles apart these seem to be this kind of for and against it. Um, but on the other hand, then you've got a whole bunch of people who, uh, I guess, um, their view of graffiti is purely based on letter forms and writing and tags, that they don't consider themselves artists. Um, I guess some people from that kind of writing graffiti culture come to sort of want to produce works that are attractive for the public and the idea of street art is making attractive works for the public, whether it be legal, illegal, um, public murals, um, maybe even advertising could even come into the broad definition of street art. But I guess graffiti increasingly kind of means culturally hip-hop based letters and writing. And I guess a lot of guys, the sort of older guys my age, they're actually fairly tolerant of different kinds of art and they like other things like stencils and stickers and things. But then you get um, maybe there's a strong but vocal minority who basically know they want it to be illegal. They prefer it all about risk and being criminal. They don't want it to be legal. And uh, increasingly I'm seeing amazing, beautiful street artworks and murals being deliberately sort of targeted and bombed. And I guess for guys who do um, graffiti murals for a living, which there are lots of in Sydney, they kind of really, really don't like the idea of someone deciding to prey on them or destroy all of their work and their livelihood. And I do know at least one artist who has been, for 10 years, someone's gone around destroying his work, which you'd kind of have to take pretty personally. And I know there's feuds that have gone on longer than this. There's 20 year old feuds that have gone on. And um, if you sort of see the really good video to watch, everyone should watch if they're interested in this, is um, Style Wars because um, there's versions of it where they interview, it's basically, basically a doco made about the graffiti kids in the early 80s in New York, and it's very good at explaining all the politics and things of the culture that we kind of accept today. And kids watch this film religiously, and they're very, very um, seriously into their graffiti history and street art history. So um, one thing that happens when they interview the same people years later, well, there's still people carrying grudges and things you know, over 20 years later. So um, people do take it really, really seriously and personally and the idea of having other people covering your work is much more of a threat or much more of a problem than having, say, the council removing your work or something like that. So yeah, people do kind of take it pretty personally if um, someone destroys their work or they kind of get worried that maybe someone's personally targeting their work. So um, I guess um, street art has said, um, includes like a whole lot of different art forms. And we've kind of seen over the years now that it's gone from just being about paint and, um, and even like paste ups and collage and stickers, which are kind of like the really early obvious kinds of things. But more and more there's people who are things like Will Coles, who uh, started by making concrete TVs that he dumped by the sculpture of the sea when he wasn't allowed in. And he kept dumping these TVs everywhere and he dumped them at galleries, he dumped them. And people threw them out and put them in bins. They are now worth $1,000 each, and he's got work in the Australian Defence Department, and he's with Art Bank, which is an amazing kind of achievement, really. And he makes concrete mobile phones and TV remote controls, which he leaves around the street and other. There's one artist I've seen from the UK who's making life-size concrete hobos and leaving them by train stations, completely barefooted, homeless people with hoods on, curled up asleep and things like this, and uh, seeing how the public interact with them and children kicking them and things like that is all kind of very strange. So, um, and I even in uh, around Sydney, there's, um, uh, there's a guy called Andy Uprock who's really got seriously into putting plastic cups in fences, which is called cup rocking, Andy Uprock cup rock. That's a very nice, clever. He's a bit of a poet as well, but uh, he's kind of made himself like he owns that form. <laughs> um, basically, yeah, doing red lettering with cups in fences, and there's galleries and things that are putting up cyclone wire fences inside for him to put cups up and things. Um, I know there's a, there are a few things that sort of particularly um, some lots of uh, crafty girls in Sydney are getting up to, including gorilla knitting, which is basically covering any street poles or furniture in woolen gear you might have seen around. Um, alas, I also noticed someone started burning them and setting fire to them, which is kind of pretty hateful. 
Um, uh, there's also people, someone at least is making um, felt little characters and people and making them into stickers and sticking them around. So you kind of see things that aren't all quite so obviously Boise. I guess graffiti writing culture is very, very Boise and masculine and um, kind of probably fair to say homophobic and um, they probably even do give the girls who are brave enough to deal with the scene a pretty hard time. And I know a lot of girls have been involved in it and have dropped out. I think probably street art is probably a bit more likely to have girls involved. And I mean, I was involved in people who did collage, paste up political kinds of work, and that was completely 50-50 male, female. So it's kind of interesting. This is, yeah, this stuff here now is just kind of what I was talking about. Um, um, just collage bits using bits of government brochures and um, fake brands or putting up advertisements and replacing all of the actual brands so the product name is completely destroyed with some fictional brand. Um, so you kind of a lot of um, uh, interesting ideas like that. With, and um, I guess uh, I said junkie, as I mentioned before, using tin cans. Um, before we started talking, I showed you some pictures with junkies artwork, which um, yeah, you just flattens tin cans, bottle caps for eyes. I've seen ones with wing, feathered wings and just um, kind of amazing stuff on them. So, um, yeah, increasingly a street art has come to include a huge amount of um, art forms and things like that. I guess um, as I'm kind of seeing increasingly, I guess even at the moment, the schism between graffiti and street art is kind of, even though there's a lot of overlaps, they are kind of getting um, bigger and worse. And um, I'm kind of, maybe I'm seeing some people are publishing books on street art and declaring that everything that is street art is somehow more meaningful or political than, than doing other kinds of art, which I'm not really quite sure whether every piece of street art is incredibly meaningful. I'm not sure whether wrapping statues in plastic to, as some link to the homeless, supposedly to help the homeless. I'm not really sure whether that's that amazing or, uh, I think if you're gonna have a message of some kind, it should be pretty obvious. And maybe you need to be trying to reach the public, not just people who do graffiti <laughs> or are interested in graffiti and street art. If you have, I mean, people who've got serious kind of message-based campaigns, I think, can do some really beautiful aesthetic work that carries their idea and their story and makes it really, really obvious. Um, and other people are just happy to be produce works that deliberately confuse you, like something that looks like an ad, but then you read it and it's just complete nonsense text, which I kind of like. That's an interesting kind of approach, but that's kind of... Um, it's just basically trying to um, Trojan horse you into looking at it, thinking it's some kind of ad, but then it's actually just some kind of random nonsense and it's some kind of commentary on advertising, but it's a bit more kind of open how you interpret that kind of work. But um, yeah, just to say that maybe every, you could say in some sense that all street art is political because um, it is about space and territory and people are, can be territorial, if not even just in space on walls, but they can be territorial with their ideas. And what materials you tend to use does tend to just define what kind of a artist you are or what other kinds of artists you work with. Um, and even though I've got, for example, a large group of friends that all do paste up art, that is doing artwork on posters and then sticking the posters up, which um, for some people's mind, that's not really very much risk-taking involved because it's only like litter fine. It's only a few hundred dollar fine carrying a bucket of glue and posters. Police can't really do anything about it. They actually have to catch you in the act of putting a poster up. And even then, most councils don't care and won't follow through or really do much. Um, I have had someone say to me that Marrickville Council, I think, cost them twice to clean up illegal advertising what graffiti does. And actually 20% of that cleaning up graffiti cost is people scratching and etching with drill bits and um, glass etching tools and things on bus windows and shop windows and things. So that's 20% of the graffiti bills is even that. So kind of what people think is the most obvious eyesore costly graffiti doesn't necessarily, people don't put advertising as one of those things or, or rate it as one of those things. Um, so I guess just a bit, that's just a whole lot of background and kind of wonderful issues afoot, but I'm just gonna grab up some other images. These are just some bits and pieces of some murals I've done, mostly with kind of paint in um, Sydney. So I guess when I got here, I really, I kind of um, basically brought a small pile of stencils with me and was basically recutting, and I was pretty poor when I started, so I only used to use black paint very early on when I was here. Um, there's also some bits of products and things like that. But I've kind of just developed my kind of mural style, which I basically usually just cover everything in lots of stripes and bubbles um, with freehand and masking tape, and then do um, 
lot of stencils on top. This, um, that long panorama back there, if I just grab it back a bit. Do, do, do. Uh, I think I've gone too far, haven't I? This one here is a panorama that the whole movement crew did. So these guys all used to just draw on posters and just cartoons, and they've all gone into being freehand wall painting with aerosol. And I said most of them have kind of got into um, galleries and some kind of legitimate income out of it. And this is just yeah, some more recent work. This is from Weeks Lane in Sydney. And it's just using this kind of fairly formulaic kind of mural approach. And that's just, I used to make a lot of fake products, um, which I would burn them when I had a big enough stock. I have ones I wouldn't sell. At the end of the year, I'd burn a big pile of them. But um, and that was in a uh, back of a gallery in Marrickville. So, um, and that was uh, a piece I did in, um, um, ran down just off Oxford Street that was removed by the council in one day. It was actually invited by the owners and painted. It was fully, they got 10 people to paint this huge wall and people complained about it, it was removed pretty quickly. Um, the council have got a rather funny attitude. Different councils are different everywhere you go. So I guess um, one uh, council, um, for example, might, like Marrickville Council, for example, doesn't really seem to care too much. They're not, in, in, certainly in the um, Newtown area, they're quite happy to have people having murals on the side of their houses and not go through a lot of red tape. Um, Sydney Council, they it seem to be a bit more litigious and like a bit more paperwork. And I guess they have this official view they're against graffiti but for street art, which is kind of a little bit of a hard thing to juggle. They want to be seen as being for art and progressive, youthful kind of art culture. But at the same time, they want to represent the um, corporate interests of the city. Um, whereas the you know, Marrickville Council, I guess it probably depends where and when, but I mean, I certainly, I live in the more Marrickville end of Marrickville and that's um, mostly just covered in bad quality tags and um, sort of fairly inept writing and letters and things like that. Which I guess if any of us are old enough to remember the 1970s in Australia, most graffiti was either toilet humour, insults, um, personal comments or attacks, um, bad jokes, poetry, politics. There's still um, uh, a rest Whitlam graffiti on my local bridge and my train tunnel. There's um, anti-radioactive um, goods being freighted through Sydney, graffiti in Sydney. There's graffiti about the Hilton bombing in Sydney from the 70s. And some of the stuff, I've actually removed it with some kind of chemical at one stage but actually now the chemical they've used has sort of somehow bleached the rock. So even though they removed the graffiti, the chemical treatment of removing the graffiti has actually created a permanent stain in the long run that's brought this lettering back. So they removed it in exactly the shape of this lettering. And I've seen some other walls around where they've scrubbed off the graffiti and painted over it and it's somehow it's got this weird clean mark. And I, there's a few other very strange kinds of forms of street art that kind of mutate from that I've seen people do. I had one person, um, I did a workshop with the Graffiti Research Lab in New York who they are into combining alternative technology with street art. So they do street art using electronics and LED lights and uh, when I was doing I made cartoon characters with glowing eyes and we could stick up and they would hold themselves magnetically up which is kind of magnetically stuck to things street art. It's kind of a bit of a problem because you're not really damaging anything and you can just say it's a temporary removable placard and it's are kind of fun, but they came up with a, a lot of the people they work with have developed some very strange forms of street art. I guess one of the weirder ones I heard was a guy who was writing with UV paint because the human eye can't see it. He had the crazy delusion that bees might be interested in it, but actually um, part of the effect was that it's not visible to the human eye, but it is visible on a security camera. So you could write on a wall something offensive about the police and they would see you doing it in daylight and um, there's nothing to show for it. Um, there's another artist in uh, France I've noticed lately, and he writes with this UV paint on walls and then goes and replaces the public light bulbs, the UV tubes, and replaces them with fluoro black light tubes. So then all the fluoro graffiti all appears and lights up, and it wouldn't be visible in daytime at all. So um, I think some people, and that's part of, I guess, the street art idiom as well, is trying to come up with new, amazing, interesting things. And I guess, um, that's one of the things I like about it, is I don't think I'll ever get bored with it. I don't think um, I'm ever going to get tired of um, uh, seeing, there's always going to be new things, there's always um, young people and new generations using new techniques and styles and stuff. So I don't think anyone's going to be an expert on it or an authority or super knowledgeable about it because um, there's just so many different threads but it's such a huge field. And I guess another thing about the problem of um, history of graffiti 
um, is just, first of all, even the use of the word graffiti everyday thing when it first appeared in, um, I guess, in Victorian times when they were digging up Pompeii. Um, the idea of graffiti on walls in these cities, the Roman cities, and they were going, wow, we've got this stuff on our walls right now happening in front of us. They suddenly took notice of popular graffiti and um, there was a man who published uh, window, people writing in the dust of their windows. He published all these witticisms off there in a book. Um, there's pictures of Napoleon doing graffiti as a kid. Um, French artist Granville was a really interesting printmaker who did like Beatles, animated Beatles and things with anthropomorphised bits and pieces. But he grew up as a street kid on France drawing caricatures and things on walls. Um, there was a caricature of one of the French kings as a pair, which it was actually a death sentence to do this piece of graffiti. Uh, Vikings graffiti the Santa Sophia. Um, Romans graffitied the pyramids, as well as two of my friend's dads who served in Egypt in World War II graffitied the pyramids. So it's kind of really has actually got an old history. Maybe it's kind of been in the, the shadow of mainstream art history, but I think it's now and now it's just become increasingly more mainstream connected to, it's becoming more and more part of the art world. It's, it's something you can't really ignore, that the fact that there's, you can have nothing to do with the fine art, um, sort of academic art world now, but you could earn a complete living with um, illustration and design and exhibiting worldwide. Now there's a whole you know, worldwide scene of this kind of street inspired um, painting and illustration and graphics and clothes and fashion out there now. So um, it's quite possible to just be an artist and say, I just want to do cute cartoon characters and make a living you know, now and there's so much more opportunity in there than there would have been once upon a time. Um, and I have to say as well, a lot of um, people from all sorts of graffiti backgrounds, writers and things that will work in art trades from sign writing to printers to um, graphic design. So there's a lot of people sort of do use this as kind of their exposure to art and end up building a career with art out of it. And I guess I also, fair to say, I've known people who have been contractually obligated that every piece of art they make belongs to their company. Everything they draw, every doodle they do on a napkin. So I've known guys like that who have deliberately gone out and done illegal work basically because that's their avenue, that's their creative outlet and they feel that they kind of own that work a lot more and things like that. So um, a lot of uh, kind of uh, interesting issues and I said that's one continually that I, I like about the whole field is that there's so many little threads and um, it's, it is always changing. It's, uh, I mean it's a global culture and once upon a time it would have been probably a lot more local, there were sort of been certainly lettering styles or people would have been influencing each other and um, copying ideas from their friends and things like that. Increasingly now people can just go to the internet and grab a whole style off the internet. So for example, um, there's artists in say Eastern Europe and Latin America who have got very different kind of illustrative styles to what's going on here. So um, there are kids who can just simply go and pick up and learn from artists overseas or some completely different context and bring them here. So um, just increasingly as a worldwide culture and, um, and ideas and things travel very, very quickly and uh, I guess young people end up using it as a whole network world that people make friends overseas and on the internet and Flickr and I know full well that I can travel anywhere and make friends online beforehand and travel somewhere and get free accommodation and catch up with local artists and things like that. So. Um, I guess it's kind of a bit like of being a secret society. It's probably kind of the, I'm not sure it's the modern version of Freemasonry or something like that. But um, I mean, I'd probably say a lot of all the friends and people I know in Sydney have all come out of being involved in art and, and in some form or other too. So, um, and I guess for a lot of other people I know involved in the scene that you know, a lot of their friends and social life revolves around the whole field. So. There's always someone exhibiting every week somewhere. There may be weeks, there's three or four or five people that you know exhibiting. People will be running around seeing everything. Um, uh, even lately in kind of the gallery scene, there's, um, there's now a thing where they're kind of having live artist battles where two artists will kind of draw, have a draw off against each other. And um, it, it, I think the idea is they're actually supposed to put each other down and be a bit mean spirited about it too. But um, it's kind of common from a scene in England, but just to actually trying to encourage any idea of artists to actually have like live public battles with a crowd cheering them on and letting the crowd decide who wins and things like that. It's kind of, um, so yeah, I, they're constantly evolving kind of new threads and things out of it all the time. Um, and I guess um, this whole kind of gallery scene that has emerged and the, uh, it's actually kind of gone on to 
there's this kind of language that's kind of evolved talk about street art and graffiti. Um, because I guess if some people are trying to get funding and things to do what is graffiti or comes from unauthorised marks on walls, but it actually ends up um, they're trying to get some sort of funding. So words like street art and urban art have become um, used by galleries and arts administrators and councils because that's somehow seen as more sort of positive and progressive. And I guess yeah, more and more the word graffiti is being kind of used by um, a particularly kind of maybe aggressive end of um, sort of hip hop inspired graffiti. Um, so it's a little bit sad. I mean, personally, I'd like, like if everyone could just sort of get along and there's plenty of room and there's certainly plenty of walls in Sydney. There's plenty of kind of horrendous, um, filthy alleyways and things in town. Um, actually, this just up here now, it's just um, from a, like a stencil mural I did at um, Pine Street for Sydney Council. So, um, and that's just from some paintings and things we did at a recent show at the Clare Hotel. So, um, just regularly we get people approaching our group, just asking, like, can you guys put on a show or an exhibition or a mural and things like that. And uh, I kind of have to say murals are a little bit of a trouble to do because there's usually such huge amount of red tape. The more officious they are, you end up spending more time administering and doing kind of admin and paper chasing um, than you do painting and getting approvals and things. And I know some people want to have two different engineers assess a wall. And most guys, when they're involved in doing wall pieces on walls, I guess um, doing it as quick as possible. And um, they're not, if it flakes off, they'll just do it again. They're not too worried about lasting for 10 years or anything like that. Permanence isn't kind of a big feature of what it's about. Um, other kinds of problems I've had just doing private murals is um, people kind of, you, you think that if someone asks you to do a mural, they want your style and you to do what you do, but it tends to not happen that way. People tend to go, oh, can you just put SpongeBob SquarePants over there or something like that? So people are very bad at giving you an order or saying what it is they want. And then after the fact, they'll kind of change things. And I have to say, having done a lot of murals and things around the last few years, most of them, none of them really went to plan. I can't say a single one we got renumerated as speedily and efficiently and um, that everything went as smoothly as it ought to have type thing. So I even find when people just try to make me break down every hour and time and plan for everything, it, it's a pretty difficult thing to do to plan for every possible hour or anything can go wrong with bad weather and things in some sort of, and it ends up taking so long just to do all the paperwork to sort of even be able to bill someone. Whereas I'd much rather just, um, I think most of us would much rather just be able to um, drink like a slab of beer and uh, do some painting between us on a wall and not worry and do exactly what we want. I certainly now pretty much people say, if you want me to do what I want, I'll do it at this price. But if you want me to do some particular piece of signage that's a complete commission of something what you want, you've got lettering and you've got you know, advertising or something on it, um, I just have to kind of charge like a wounded bull for that now and hopefully even put off a lot of <laughs> troublesome customers. So, um, uh, yeah, but more and more I guess say to people, look, if you let us do what we want and it's in a good location and um, you can provide us with all our materials, it'll probably get done pretty easily and quickly. If you want some piece of corporate signage for your business or something, that kind of gets a little bit more involved. And um, I do know artists who are getting paid. Um, I mean, while we, I, during Fashion Week lately, I had people asking us to do various jobs for pittance amounts of money, really, and I know other people who are being paid a thousand dollars, like a whole group of eight artists and each one's being paid a thousand to do some background for a fashion shoot. I know other people have been paid um, huge amounts of money to do like parts of department stores and things like that. So there are people willing to pay and um, to do this kind of work out there. And I guess um, Sydney, as I said, ma has managed to keep me reasonably employed. I probably would say maybe there's more people in Melbourne. I know, I know a lot of artists in Melbourne who are working this kind of work and getting a living out of it there. But I do kind of um, feel that, um, I have to say all their, their window shopping and everything like that, they're very visually orientated there. The window shopping looks kind of almost like an extension of the street art and things in Melbourne and things. Uh, and they kind of are willing to pay people more to do this kind of artwork. But um, I do find sort of Sydney's got a good edge behind it. And in some ways, maybe the culture doesn't feel as overdeveloped. I mean, there's probably, there could easily be several hundred galleries dealing in work like this in Melbourne. It's just small sort of artist run galleries, whereas you know, Sydney, there's a few. And I even have to say a lot of galleries that start off saying that they're street art galleries 
because I guess the street art scene has got maybe a good partying lifestyle and people who know how to have a good time. And uh, so people will start off a gallery saying it's a street art gallery, but I find that check out what they're doing a year or two later and they're usually just earning rent by charging art students $800 a week or something for rent. And you start seeing they have less and less work to do with street art that will come from any from the street or even rejecting artists who do work on the street because they worried about having the law or something um, take an interest in them or something like that. So it's um, these constant flip-flops and uh, things turning 360 degrees all the time. Um, how are we going for time, David? That's so cool. <laughs> okay, cool. Because I, I, yeah, well, I, I probably could keep going for a long time. But I will come and ask some questions in a bit and things like that too, if people are interested. Um, I guess kind of say maybe as to um, interesting things happening around Sydney right now, um, certainly probably some interesting artists I like. Um, Jumbo and Zap, who are all around sort of Chippendale, Surrey Hills. Um, there's one on the hub in Newtown right now, with just giant paste-ups, like paste-ups that are two storeys high, 12 metres wide. So people are drawing, producing artworks on paper of these massive scales and then going and pasting them up in daylight. You know, just put on a hard hat and a vest. And um, some of this work is being deliberately left up. Like the, the one on the hub, everything else on the hub has been removed four times and this large piece has been left completely intact. So um, yeah, it is kind of interesting seeing that sometimes pieces do survive. And I, I guess um, I have seen other areas where say um, the stencils might survive, but they'll remove uh, tags and other kinds of graffiti. And then the tags start appearing next to the stencils and then they paint over the tags. And then the tagger kids, you can see them getting a bit annoyed at this stage, so they just put tags on the stencils and then they all get removed. So and I, I, there's little things like this you can see which kind of create these kind of conflicts and things. I mean, one thing I don't think those kids necessarily want people to, everyone to like what they're doing or like their work and things, but um, I, it's just, um, some people it's really become a big deal of what it's, if there's one stencil on a wall, that's the thing they're gonna cover or hit type thing. Um, which is, is kind of sad, but um, there's a couple of um, stencil walls around uh, Sydney as well. There's one in uh, Enmore and there's um, kind of one in Chippendale, just off Broadway at the moment. Uh, so, and I have to say, like a few times I've been involved in someone creating a wall like this and pretty much instantly you get people doing fashion shoots in front of it, you get people, hundreds and hundreds of people taking photographs, like every day you're getting 50 people taking their photographs in front of it. It's very easy to create a tourist attraction that people are interested in and is very visually kind of interesting. Um, but I said it's not very often that people let artists do whatever they want. <laughs> I do find... Um, the mural process generally is let's find a hundred people and get their opinions or have and then you know, we have to do it with some school kids or something as well and you've just increasingly adding all these more kind of complicated things and putting more people's opinions into the mix. Um, whereas I think yeah, maybe some um, kind of artist work is maybe kind of basically even kind of selfish and self-indulgent but um, I think I kind of preferred seeing um, artists really let loose and do what they want than um, just making signage for companies and businesses really or councils. So um, thank you all for <laughs> coming and listening and things like that anyway. Has anyone got any questions or anything? Yeah, when are you going to paint the wall? Which one's here? Yeah, oh, well, yeah. let me. It's all good. I'm up for it. <laughs> There's still some bits from the open day on that, those wooden panels out there. It'd be nice to go and tuck up that sometime, put some more things up there. Any other questions? Come on, I haven't killed anyone or anything. <laughs> um, yeah, I did actually. Um, I'm kind of, I've been booked in the last few years and I used to actually make about three, four hundred dollars a day there. But I didn't get a booking. All the bookings went in about two hours this year round and it was much more overcrowded than previously. So they might think about moving it to one of the whole floors upstairs or something because it was just all, it's not like the carriage works or something like that, even would be pretty good because it's just huge, but it's, it's got some stags. Uh, MCA is one of the best ones in Australia, zine fairs, but it's, um, uh, it's just so crowded and it, it shouldn't be that hard to get a seat or book a stall or something like that. Or It'd be nice if they could do it every three months or something like that, so it wasn't quite so crazy <laughs> instead. But no, I really kind of like the whole zine culture and things like that. I mean, I... How Stephen Marsh get cast up here? Yeah. That was my friend Miss Helen teaching that. Yeah, she was there and there was a couple of actors in Melbourne, I think. And the guy who put the Zoom shop in Melbourne. 
Yeah. Yep, sticky. Your guy. Yep. Yeah. So it's quite different. But it's very common. Yeah. No, there's some. Certainly. I mean, I, it's funny because I curate a lot of events that have street art and sort of DIY culture, which includes zine making and things. And part of that is because the DIY scene's got more girls. The graffiti scene has got more boys. And if you stick them both together, it's a good way of just balancing out the sexes. And I also think they're both forms of self-publishing. I mean, really, if it's all about, I'm an artist, I want people to see my stuff, well, I can either make my own books or I can stick stuff on a wall. It's all a form of publishing. And I have to say, art on walls, relief art, is one of the oldest forms of mass communication in the world. I mean, it predates TV and you know, advertising or artwork on walls. Um, and often with some sort of story, like comic book narrative and things like that. There's, it's a very old medium that's, um, you know, you can say cave art and, you know, Egyptian tomb art and things, it's all kind of relief wall art. So it's an underrated medium. I think it is a worldwide medium. You can put something on your wall now and it could spread anywhere in the world now. So it's a worldwide wall scroll. <laughs> Um, I do a couple of tours a month. Um, I can give out some cards if anyone's interested. I've got a, um, if anyone's interested in coming on a tour, I do um, a couple of, uh, basically in Newtown, about two and a half hour walk around Newtown. And I have done them other places. I do them in Adelaide and things as well a couple of times a year. Um, and I do them for fair, or any fairs or events or festivals or anything that kind of wants me to do one, I'll do it for them. So anyone who's interested in that, you're welcome to come and grab a card off me. Um, and I also brought a couple of just some um, sketchbooks and things which have got sort of stencils and drawings and it's just bits and pieces by different artists or friends of mine who happened to be there when I was working on it. So you're welcome to have a little bit of a browse through that. And I've even got a, like a portfolio case with probably more design, publishing kind of stuff, print media. But I guess a lot of that kind of stuff I've done fed into my sticker art and things which you might even find familiar. <laughs> so cool, thank you very much for coming. It's been really nice being here. Thank you.